Welcome to a world where particles, vibrations, and light collide. A place where leading industry experts and healers come together to discuss controversial topics that will challenge your beliefs and expand your mind. From quantum physics to metaphysics, no topic is off limits, but this is not your typical podcast. And that's what's so critical. What you're thinking is still going inside of your body. Just because you don't say the words doesn't mean that it's not so, because you still think, right? And so we've gotten to the point where, well, as long as I keep my mouth shut, I'm okay. (laughs) No, you're not. You're still storing up your body. You are still putting emotions in your body because of your need to be right. And if we have no right or wrong, then what is? And that's all there is, right? It's either energy or it's not. Whether you're speaking the words, whether you're thinking the words, whether you're thinking it still matters. It's a show guaranteed to make you question your assumptions and push you to expand your horizons. For those who are already fascinated or passionate about the work of Patty Conklin, this show will give you an inside look into the mind of one of the industry's most renowned figures in vibrational mediation. With over 28 years of experience and a long list of big name collaborations, Patty's insights and perspectives will inspire and challenge even the most seasoned practitioners. And if you're the skeptic who doesn't believe in vibrational mediation, this show is for you. Healers, doctors, and scientists are just a few of the professions represented by our fascinating visitors that bring their unique perspective to every episode. Join us on this journey into the world of healing within an adventure inside. Our mission is to inspire, challenge, and enlighten our audience with thought-provoking conversations and fascinating guests from a wide range of fields who can shed new light on important issues facing society today. Join us for each episode if you're ready to explore and learn about the latest developments at the intersection of cutting-edge science, spirituality, and self-improvement. Enter a world where waves, particles, and light all meet. Enter the world of healing within and adventure inside. Hi, everyone. It's Patty Conklin. Mark Matusik is an award-winning author of seven books, including the memoirs, The Boy He Left Behind, and When You're Falling, Dive, which I really want to hear about. Um, His writing has appeared in many publications, including The New Yorker, O, The Oprah Magazine, um, Details, um, Tricycle, Good Housekeeping, Harper's Bazaar, and The Village Voice, as well as anthologies such as Wrestling with the Angel, Voices of the Millennium, Oprah's Best Life, and A Memory, A Monologue, and A Rant, and A Prayer, which I also want to talk about. He blogs for Psychology Today and often courses in creativity and offers courses in creativity and spiritual growth around the world using the writing to awaken method. Born in Los Angeles, Matusik graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, won a fellowship to study at Worcester. I always want to mess this up. Worcester. 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 See, you know, my New York gets in the way. Um, College, Oxford, and earned an MA in English literature from UCLA. In 1981, he moved to New York, working for Reuters International and Newsweek before becoming the first staff writer and senior editor for Andy Warhol's interview magazine, interviewing hundreds of famous figures. Boy, we could do four different segments on all of this. Mark, (laughs) welcome so much to the show. I I appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, let's dive in. Talk to me about you. Sounds good. Thank you, Patty. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, So what took you on this path? Anything specific or a series of events of becoming a writer and, and uh, doing what you love? That's a big question. You know, I've been a seeker ever since I was a little boy. I grew up in a house where there was a lot of danger, violence, abandonment, trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I turned inside at a very young age for guidance and for answers uh, that I wasn't getting from the people around me. Uh And I started to write when I was very young, eight or nine years old, I started to keep a journal because I realized that when I wrote things down, no matter how crazy things were around me in the house, I always felt better. I always felt clearer. Uh, And so I really date becoming a writer and a seeker to those very, very uh, early years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that led to being a journalist first and a memoir writer, uh, eventually a teacher. 
But for me, the question that drives When You're Falling Dive, the book you mentioned earlier, and really all of my writing is how do you live? How do you, how do you live? My sister uh, committed suicide when I was 20 years old and she came to me two weeks before she killed herself. Uh, and she said, how do you do it? And I said, do what, Marcia? She said, how do you live? And that for oh. me became the theme, the mantra of my life. And it's guided everything that I've done as a writer, as a teacher uh, until now. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, just, um, you know, having, having the ability to live, you know, when you're coming up in a, in a violent household and um, the decisions that we make. Yeah. And how do you, how does any of us live? You know, yeah. knowing what we know about the world, about, about the human condition, uh, dealing with all the fears, uncertainties, particularly nowadays with the pandemic, it's really in people's faces. And yeah. so a lot of us are asking the kinds of questions that seekers and survivors ask all the time. Right. Is, what does this mean? You know, yeah. what am I doing here? Is there any purpose to this? Is there any power that's larger than me? Right. Uh, and, and how can I use suffering to wake up uh, as grist for the mill, as, as, as fuel? And yeah. that really was my mission, you know, not only as a survivor, but also in writing When You're Falling Dive, was to find people who had lived through extraordinary uh, traumas and losses of various kinds, from yeah. Joan Didion, you know, to a, to a, a paraplegic, you know, a preacher in, in Georgia. Yes. And how did they get through it? I really wanted to see if there were through lines, if there were refrains or themes that repeated. And I found that there actually were. And, and what were those? I mean, what, what was the, the theme that kind of went through, um, not everyone, but a majority of people? I would say the one universal is that if you think your life is going to be the same after a crisis or a trauma, you're wrong and you won't actually benefit from the experience. Yeah. You really have to let go of what was uh, in order to let what wants to come in uh, enter our lives. Yeah. And so person after person I interviewed said the same thing, that there's no going backward. And the people who try to hold on to, to the past uh, are, are the ones that get even more beaten up than yeah. the folks who can release and say, well, thy will be done. Let's, let's see what life has in store for me. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that I always say, and, and I believe it, is that, you know, good always comes out of bad. And, and I think that when we focus on what good, even if it was a, quote, bad situation, um, we can reframe the memory. You know, as a kid growing up in a, you know, drug and alcohol household, um, you know, it was, I just kept looking at my surroundings saying, this is not the way I want to live. This is, you know, living in poverty and living this life is not what I want. And at 12, I left home because I went, you know what, I am better off on my own finishing up school um, on the streets than I am continuing to live in this situation. Wow. So, you know, it, at uh, just about 65 now, I kind of look at life going, you know, when you have that kind of a childhood, you know that there's nothing that can't be accomplished. Mm. You know, that if you survive that, then you've got a very strong building block foundation. Um, and it sounds like, you know, that's the, that's the theme. Either people are going to fall into it and stay into that early childhood that they have no control over, right, right. Um, or they're going to step out of it. And, um, you know, sometimes become the overachiever. Um, but I think that, that, you know, listening and being able to interview, are, is there one person that really stands out uh, for you in the, in the people that you've worked with through the years or taught? Um, oh, that, that's that, that there are so many people. So I've yeah. met so many brave people yeah. who, who are facing challenges of, you know, of many, many different kinds, whether it's Stanley Kunitz, who was the American poet. I interviewed him when he was 100 years old. And he talked, he talked about uh, the, the penalties that you pay for aging, but he's happy to pay them. Yes. You know, I spoke to Joan Didion after her husband died in front of her eyes uh, in, their, in their dining room. Uh, I spoke to an amazing couple uh, named Jack and Mary Willis, who he had been, he had been uh, paralyzed 
two weeks before their wedding uh, oh. anniversary, their wedding rather, in when they oh. were 28. And she stayed with him for the next 60 years, you know, as oh. he, you know, as he, you know, as he adapted to, to living that way. And, and they were an amazingly strong couple. So I've, I've, I've interviewed so many people. And the, what moves me is that there's this power that we have that we don't have to invent it. It's in us already. Right. What we have to do is remove the obstacles to letting to, to it manifesting. Yeah. And that yeah. means confronting a lot of our, our stories and a lot of our beliefs that, that aren't serving us. You, you said earlier, you know, there's nothing that we can't get over. And yeah. my only caveat to that would be if we try. If we try. If we try. If we don't bring attention to it, if we aren't willing to let go of, of the past, if we're not willing to look at our own shadow, things aren't going to change. They're going to get worse. That's right. So it, uh, some people think, well, if, you know, if, you know, bad things, you know, good things always come out of bad. Not quite. They come yeah. out of bad when we are uh, mindful. Yeah. And, we, and when we have some intention. Very true. Very true. Because that's that's all about um, moving forward is that intent in and uh, and being able to look at it and not as this devastating thing. But how did I grow from it? You know, how did I move? But, you know, I go back to you and and I'm sure the viewers of how do you dive? I mean, so so you're in a situation um, that's maybe not conducive to your best life ever. Um, how do you how do you dive? I mean, a how do you find the strength to dive, and what are you diving towards? Yeah. I mean, so t- yeah, two two things. The first thing is you need to tell the truth. Yeah. You know, we need to really face the facts as they are in the moment. Yeah. And we have to be willing to dive into mystery and dive into the unknown. Yeah. Part of healing is letting go of control, that kind of egoic control. So we need to be willing to uh, to not know yeah. and to be in beginner's mind in order to discover new ways of being. And when, right. when that willingness is there, extraordinary things are possible. Yeah. yeah. And when it's not there, you can't put it there. Right. Because I've spoken to many people who, who simply didn't want to change. They, they just said, it's not worth it for me going on the way I am if I can't have what I had. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, self-pity is, the, is not helpful when it comes to healing it's and awakening. It's self-pity, not self-pity is not our friend. No, no. The self-pity, the victim mode. And, you know, so many people, it seems like, don't understand when they're in the victim mode. You know, unless it's expressly pointed out to them of, you know, the statement you just made, it's like, I've got a great life considering I've got, you know, gotten rid of my ex. And (laughs) and it's like, okay, so you just went into victim mode. They're like, no, I'm not. I I just made a statement. It's like, you have a great life. End of sentence. End of sentence. Yes. Not getting getting rid of the ex is not the continuation of that. Um, it's, it's the end of sentence of, I have a great life and just kind of catching them on that wording of just, you know, how are they expressing when, when you're teaching, when you're talking with people, um, are you, and I'm assuming you are listening very carefully to how they're phrasing their words, how they're absolutely, particularly as a writing teacher, I teach a a form of self-inquiry through writing called writing to awaken and it's really about confronting our narratives mm. uh, and it can be quite painful yeah and there have been times when i've suggested to people that there was a victimizing tone in the, in their way in their work that they rejected and i never saw them again so yeah. there are people who really don't want to look at it uh, but when folks are open yeah the possibilities for transformation are extraordinary and they're amazing when- they are, and but and but you make an important point about listening because you need to hear the language that people use to describe their experience because mm-hmm. language dictates experience. It, it, it language dictates perception. Perception dictates experience. Absolutely. So how what what stories are you telling yourself about who you are and how you got here? Right. And how true are those stories? Right. Right. That's really, the key. Absolutely. Well, because it seems like in so much of people's lives with the people that I work with, and I think the people you work with, is they've created a narrative that's either more painful 
or less painful than what actually took place. And, and the whole memory cycle of what really took place gets askewed. And, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so you, you get in this situation where it seems like you're working with people, their memories are skewed. You can tell it's askewed. And how do you kind of bring them back around to take that dive, to, to you know, take that dive into living? I, I think that that's, it's not a dive into stagnation. It's not a dive into <clears throat> a negative. It's a dive into living. And, and what, what does that mean for you? Well, it, it's, you're making a critical point. You know, Bessel van der Kolk, who works with uh, trauma survivors and is one of the foremost voices in that world says that the difference between people who heal from trauma and the ones who don't is the willingness to change your story. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you're stuck in that narrative, if you're saying, this is it, that's how it happened, this is what it was, nothing is going to shift. There's yeah. no, there's no, no evolution is possible. Yeah. It's only when we're willing to change, to question the story and, and how am I holding this? How am I framing this? What kind of role do I, am I putting myself in? Yeah. Uh, that things can start to change. Right. So that's what I do with people. I, I say that when you tell the truth, your story changes. And when your story changes, your life is transformed. And that really is, it sounds facile, but that really is how it works. Because we're because interpreting perception. at every moment. Yeah. You, know, you and I are having this conversation. We're in two different movies. We yep. have two different stories going on about what, and after we hang up, we will have a different uh, memory of what happened. Absolutely. Neither Absolutely. of those is the objective truth. That's right. That's right. Perception's everything. I mean, it really is. And, and our languaging, as you said earlier, creates that perception of when we're moving forward. This may be a strange question, but you know, I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, is there a cultural difference around the world? I mean, I work in 62 countries. And one of the things I notice is how we store stories. I mean, not only in our bodies, in terms of a disease process, but how culturally we store. Have you noticed um, in a cultural sense, people who are willing to let go of hardships of life and move forward into a positiveness? Is there any one country that stands out for you that that you can can look at and say, you know, these these folks, yeah, they may be going through a rough time, but they're able to get in and start living. That you know, that's that's a tricky question. What I can say generally is that folks in the East, mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about India, we're talking about Asia, uh, the eye is not so huge. Yeah. Yeah, the eye is not the middle of the universe. They don't see that that ego as the center of the story. They see themselves communally. They see themselves in a cultural context. Uh, so it's not as hard for folks I've worked with from countries in the East uh, to realize that, that their narrative is not the gospel truth and that they're not the cent you know, that they're not all that important. Right, um, right. On right. the other hand, folks in the West, particularly in the United States, are very willing to do the work. So often there's a kind of a pass, there can be a kind of passivity that I've come across in terms of spiritual practice in particular right. um, in, in the East. Whereas here we dive in, you know, we, you know, Americans, we put on our, you know, <laughs> marching shoot, marching boots, we're ready to go. So it goes, you know, there are strengths and weaknesses on both sides, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So in growing up, was there any one thing? I mean, obviously you were, a, a, sounds like a very open child and a, a child who observed um, life. Um, is, there, is there anything from your childhood that really kind of made you look and say, this is an avenue that I'd like to start walking to become a journalist or, or to become someone who's really talking to others about their stories? I've been doing it since I was a very small boy. Not only was I writing in a journal when I was eight years old, nine years wow. old, but I was asking people about their stories, about themselves. Mm -hmm. My mother's and older sister's friends used to come over and talk to me when I was a little boy because I was so interested in, their, in, in who they were. Yeah. And I would ask them questions that most people didn't ask. You know, I think that we come into our lives like the acorn. I think we come into our lives with what our our genius is or what our gift is mm -hmm. and yeah. my calling has always been uh, around around story yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, that's what that's what made me that's what made me into an interviewer. That's I never wanted to be a journalist. I was just interested in people people's stories. Yeah. And it's then what you know what turned me into a memoir writer and now working with people uh, telling their stories. It's all of a piece. Right. So right. that for me was the that that was the giveaway was yeah. that as a kid, I couldn't get enough of other people's stories. And the other thing was because I was a very lonely child, a very kind of alienated child. It was an opportunity to connect. And I found that when you ask people questions, you could connect. Yeah. And yeah. they felt seen and they were interested and, and they found you interesting. And it was a mode of, of, you know, of bonding. Yeah. And I've been doing it ever since. I've never gotten tired of it. I never wow. weary of hearing people's stories, sure. reading yeah. people's stories. Yeah. Moving from journalistic into working with people. I mean, obviously, and I'm not going to say that as a journalist, you weren't working with people because in your own way, you were continuing to work with people by allowing them to tell their stories, right? And be able, you know, when people tell their stories, it seems like they have a reflection of what they've spoken about. And, um, and so moving into working with people now, um, what are you enjoying about it? I get so much joy out of it. And it's not something I ever planned to do. I was, I've always been a writer. That's been my, my, my identity. Yeah. Uh, and then about 15 years ago, someone asked me at a college to come and teach a writer's week, a week long workshop. And it was the strangest thing. I walked into the room with these 12 people around the table and I knew what to do. I knew what to do. Wow. And I realized that all of those years of trial and error, I mean, I'd been a writer for 30 years at that point. I had learned something. I had learned something not only about the craft of writing, but about telling the truth and going inward and, and being honest about your story. So I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with it from the first time I did it. I never planned it. And I just, one thing led to another. Then I wrote this book called Writing to Awaken, which is really the method that, that I use. And I have never given a workshop, and I've given many, many workshops now around the world that I didn't leave feeling Hi, just feeling so much joy. There's something about when people reveal themselves and you can be in that space of truth together that is like nothing else. Right, right. I, I absolutely love it. So I have for my life, I feel like I wear two hats now, one, three really, but the two major ones are as a, as a writer, but a, as a teacher. And I get very different um, satisfaction from both of them. Yeah, yeah. As a teacher, is there, is there a message that you um, that you relate uh, to people or a, a message that you really want your your student to walk away with? Yes, uh, the message is tell the truth. Yeah, because if you think you're telling it now, you're mistaken. Right. You know, right. Very rarely do we tell the whole truth. We yeah. go through our lives every day, you know, telling euphemisms, lies by omission. We do what psychologists call reputation management. How am I looking? What are they thinking about me? So we're constantly uh, censoring and editing the truth. So the first thing I say to people is being able to confront the truth as we know it in that moment uh, is the first step uh, to awakening. Yeah. Uh, but it's not the capital T absolute truth. It's the small T messy, changeable human truth that we're all right. the contradictory truth we're all dealing with. Right. Uh, and until you do that, you're it's it, that's the doorway into your into the self. It's the doorway into insight. Right. And right. a lot of folks are just not willing to go there, but many are. And, and, yeah. and it's extraordinary how fast people, how far people can go and how quickly when they just drop that that censorship and that right. shame. And right. say, this is who I am. This is what's true for me today. And when they see it on a piece of paper. It, it, that's where the insight comes in. Yeah. They're, they're taking what's inside and putting it outside. And it's that and when they can observe them and say, God, is that what I think? Right. Is that really what I think? Is that my story? That's when the light bulbs go off. Yeah. And it's such an important light bulb. I mean, it's just, it's the only light bulb. It's the only light bulb. People, people will say when I'm teaching, why do you share so much about your history? You know, why do you share those really uncomfortable and, and just, you know, they're uncomfortable to listen to. And, and my feeling is if I'm willing to share everything that took place and not censor it and not, 
you know, leave stuff out, then it gives you permission in your life to do the same because, you know, whether someone judges you or not, <clears throat> it's your choice as to whether or not you're going to allow their judgment to affect you. Their, their thoughts are their thoughts and that's all that really is. And, and if you choose to let that uh, rain on your parade, then, then that's what is, right? Uh, then you shouldn't be teaching. Then you, you shouldn't should, be teaching. You yeah. shouldn't be teaching, really, because I mean, you know this as a teacher. You use all the tools at your disposal. Yeah. To bring insight and to prompt, you know, prompt insight. Sometimes it's being very personal. Sometimes it's it being quite probing with other people, and yeah. and, and people can be. Some people love it and they thrive. Other people go in the other direction. They're not meant to work with me, for example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but. Um, I agree with you about, about being willing to tell your story and be honest about yourself gives other people permission to do the same. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said something really smart to me when I was writing my first memoir, Sex, Death, Enlightenment. Uh, I was very nervous about being self-absorbed or being narcissistic or I felt like me, 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 me. And she said, you have to remember that when people read your story, they're not reading about you. They're reading about themselves. Yeah. So and when she said that, I got it. I said, oh, so if I go deeply enough into my experience, it can benefit people in all kinds of uh, circumstances. And that has proved to be, be the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk to me about sex, um, death, and enlightenment. Um, what was the basis of that? Well, Sex, Death, Enlightenment was my first book, other than I had done a collaboration with Andrew Harvey, our mutual friend. We oh wrote a book God. called Dialogues with the Modern Mystic in 1994. And then in 96, I had been a Dharma bum for about 10 years, just kicking around anywhere, any teacher I could go to, any, any monastery, ashram. I was just wanting to learn. I was just passionate about it. And I wanted to tell the story of a cynical, alpha male, American guy uh, who gets clobbered over the head and goes on a journey. Uh, and the theme, the theme, the takeaway of the book was if it could happen to me, it could really happen to anybody because I was not, I was an atheist, very skeptical, very cynical. Uh, and I started to have experiences uh, in India uh, and with various teachers that I couldn't explain. Yeah. And they, I couldn't engineer them. They, these were absolutely bona fide spiritual experiences. So I wanted to write a book that spoke to cynics, skeptics, atheists, people who, who, don't, who aren't sort of drawn to this stuff uh, naturally, yeah. but who are hungry for answers in their lives. So that was my, that was my idea. And it came together beautifully. You know, there a, a, a publisher found me uh, and I, at those times when you feel like you're out in the desert by yourself. Yeah, I, a, a publisher found me. They fell in love with the book uh, and it really began my career uh, a, as a writer. Wow. Know? Wow. I think that that's a real key is is people, especially if they're attending workshops, if they're attending um you know, ashrams, if they're, they're attending temple, they're, they're always looking for the teacher. And, and it just seems like, well, okay, um, you're searching and searching's wonderful, but at some point you need to stop yes. and walk your talk and, Absolutely. and, and stop looking for the teacher and realize the teacher is within you. And, Absolutely. Um, and that yeah. was exactly my experience. I was 10 years on the road. And then I realized that what had started out as a, as a sincere quest was yeah. becoming an escape and that I needed to go home. I needed to pay my rent. I needed to get an apartment. I needed to settle down. I needed to confront the things that I was running away from. Yeah. How do yeah. you have a relationship? How do you have a livelihood that feels, you know, in, in harmony with your spiritual values yeah. How do you live as an integrated person in the world? Yeah. And I needed to, I needed to find that out. When I first came back from India, I was so high and I, I had met these extraordinary teachers and enlightenment, enlightenment, enlightenment. It's all I could think about. And uh -huh. I was having dinner with somebody and I was going on and on about enlightenment and Satori and Nirvana and, uh, and his eyes were glazing over. And I said, what is it? He said, are you talking about kindness? And I said, oh, shoot. <laughs> it was it was a it was a huge teaching for me because I realized I had gone off into a big fantasy land and yep. I needed to bring it back and start being kind. Yeah. Because truthfully, it was turning into a kind of another kind of ego trip. 
spiritual right. materialism. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to, I had to get real. Yeah. That ego trip where, where somebody is just, this is what is, you know, you need to listen to me because oh. this is what is. Oh. And, uh, and yeah, you glaze over real fast. Um, I, I felt know. so superior. This is what was, I, when I came back from India, I yeah. felt so superior. Yeah. Like I had really, I had found some, and I had, but what the ego does is it, you know, turns it into something about, about, us about oneself right when the, I real I needed to drop that and that was the best possible thing he could have said in that moment yeah because I was forgetting about kindness I was mm-hmm. I was all it was all about transcendence yes and liberation with a capital L yes not so much <laughs> I start I start my workshops out by saying I'm up here teaching today and it's not because I'm right and it's not because I'm wrong it's because I don't mind sharing my thoughts with you. And you can walk out of here saying, I love that. I loved what she said. Or you can walk out of here saying, God, what a waste of money and time. <laughs> Either way, you have to think about what I said. Right. And, right. and that's the whole point, right? Is just you take away. It's not a personality contest. I don't need you. I don't need you liking me. No. I, I want you to hear and if it's not for you, it's not for you. It's no skin off my back. And people are like, you're just so blase about that. And I'm like, well, because I've seen enough people that come in who do the workshop after the workshop and they've taken so many different things. And, and it's a challenge to get them to just know you're responsible for what you are listening to today. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that's an important point. And this is what I love about teaching is it's not about us. Mm-mm. You know, writing, there's still ego. And, you know, there's the ego in being a creative artist. But when I'm teaching a class or I'm teaching a seminar of, of some kind of workshop, it's not about me. Yeah. You really, as a teacher, you really have to be your best self. You've got to get out of the way. You have to listen you know, equally to everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's, and you don't, you don't react, you can't be reactive. There can't be any judgment. Right. And so I find that being a uh, teaching is itself a kind of spiritual practice. It really yeah. is. Yeah, it's a kind of a purification. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So are you, with the age of COVID coming out of COVID, are you traveling? Are you teaching? What's I what's know. life looking like for you these days? I am. I'm teaching. I did my first live workshop in January down in Costa Rica. I teach a Blue Spirit Costa Rica every year. Yeah. Uh, and I'm giving a workshop in London in June and a, a week long in Italy in June. So it's nice to get get out again, to, to connect with people live again. Yes. Uh, I, I'm loving it. But even at the wor- in the worst of COVID, Patty, I, I wasn't uh, isolating. Good. I, I was not. I was very clear that I wanted something. I need. It wasn't sustainable for me. Right. And so I've just been really, really careful. Yeah. And so far, you know, so far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's what's so important. The The year before COVID, I decided it was time to come off the road um, because one of my wake up moments was, you know, being a workaholic is a really great way not to have a relationship. And, and so I had to sit back and do some, some self-writing of what are you doing this for? Yeah, you can stay busy, but is it the ultimate truth of what you want in your life? And I realized that's going to change, but you know, get home for a little bit longer time spans and and be able to look at that. I think that getting back out on the road or staying out on the road is awesome. It's just uh, amazing that um, that you're taking, still taking the time to go out there and and be with people. And uh, I, I I love it. I love. I get so much from it. As yeah. you, I'm sure you do too. I, yeah. I get as much from it as I as I give. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I truly love it. I, I need my quiet time because I'm a writer I'm, and I'm quite an introverted person by nature. So I really need a lot of seclusion. I need a lot of privacy, but I love connecting with people as well. Yeah. 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 It's, it's that, uh, it's that dynamic. that's so important, you know, going, going on the road, being with people and coming home and, and as a, I'm an introvert. I, I like being alone. And so the road gives me the chance to be with people and, and be able to come home. So are you working? Are you writing again? Good. I am. I'm finishing a book right now about Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh-huh. 
and it is uh, coming well. I've been working on it for many years, and I'm turning that in at the end of the summer. It's about Emerson's spiritual teachings. I've been in love with Ralph Waldo Emerson since I was a teenager. So that's, that's been completely absorbing and immersive, and I've, uh, I've been really loving writing this book. How fascinating. I mean, just the, the spiritual aspect of, yes, um, yes. of that. I, he, was, I, he was the first mystic teacher in, in, in this country. I mean, yeah. he, was talk, he was talking non-duality in 1825 right. in, in, in New England. Yeah. He was talking about, you know, uh, know yourself a man and be a god. You know, he, he, was, he yeah. was our first mystic pioneer. So wow. I'm, I'm, I've been loving it and uh, I'm happy that it's almost over. <laughs> so when, when any idea when that's going to be making its uh, uh, way known? Next year. Yeah. Next yeah, next year. yeah. Yeah. It'll yeah. be 2023. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. I have so enjoyed being able to visit with you and and hear your world and and so forth I just um an amazing person who can just put um I don't know I guess put your light on I I don't know how to phrase it well of just being you and being real and uh and allowing yourself to share so I thank thank you you yes thanks for having me on it's been wonderful to meet you it's been wonderful to meet you, and I'd love to do one later on in the fall if you have a chance to uh, have you back on and, and uh, look at your summer travels and what you've been doing. So That sounds great. So, Mark Matusik, thank you so much for being a part of today and, uh, and being a part of my world and my viewers' worlds. Thank you, Patty. Good luck. Have a great summer. Thank you so much. <laughs>